first secretary of the embassy of the Republic of Singapore, Kairul Azman Ramat, it's an honor to welcome you at ANCB. Dear Richard Hassel, dear Wong Mun Sum, welcoming friends is always a pleasure. Patrick Bingham Hall, heartily welcome. Thank you for bringing us this new publication about these outstanding architects. Dear Matthias Sauerbruch, thank you for following our invitation to get in conversation with these two metropolitan citizens and designers. And Andres Ramirez and Michael McGuinness, thank you for arranging this event. Ladies and gentlemen, nice to see so many friends here. It was in 2004, we have just started the world tour of two exhibitions we had conceptualized and produced for the Goethe Institute with the title Made in Germany, Architecture and Religion and Architecture and Ecology. When Urban Vire from A plus U approached us on this issue to propose an exhibition on VOHA to get another view on sustainable architecture. We met then in person and on site in Singapore, and finally in 2006, we staged the first VOHA exhibition at ADIS, exactly 10 years ago. Maybe it has been your first exhibition in Europe. Yes? <laughs> <laughs> Since then, we have followed your amazing career. Unbelievable. If you see the number of projects built and the frequency they receive international awards, did you know this office has a special trophy delivery backdoor? <laughs> but they don't receive these acknowledgements because of excellent self-promotion, but because of substantial contribution to the challenges of urban living. VOHA is not just big, they are great. And they have stayed always grounded, which makes them also very sympathetic. Moha thinks urban. That's why the architecture is functioning. It suits to the demands of the people who live and work in dense urban conditions. And while their built project had to follow the demands and restrictions of reality, these guys stayed visionary, provoking with urban schemes beyond our imagination, but not for its own sake, but instigating always a new dialogue and the search for new solutions for the future city. And what struck me, the methodology of communication. I remember with pleasure the fictional daily Singapore newspapers dated somewhere in 2050, which you have presented in Singapore and later at our Asia Smart City Symposium here at ANCB. While Patrick now will give us a brief introduction on the main aspects of the new publication, Garden City, Mega City. Matthias Sauerbruch from Sauerbruch Hutton Architects, in dialogue with Monsum and Richard, will find out tonight where we are and where we go in our future and what role plays VOHA in this discourse, not only in the tropics and why not in Berlin. Who's next? <laughs> Patrick. Thank you. Please. Richard, we need, we need to change the, um, we need the slide. Ah. There's one, yeah, there's just one next to <coughs> one, one in the middle. The other, the other part. Yeah. Shh. Be very, very quiet. <coughs> Guten Abend. I'm not going to explain the book because, to be quite frank, it's a, a book that you need to read thoroughly and it, um, it has to explain itself. There's too much complexity. So despite that wonderful invitation, I'm not going to bore you. With the explanation now, I can only hope that you buy, borrow, or steal 
and work it out for yourself. Um, I'd like to read you a short story instead. The short story is called The Bungalow Story. Is everybody ready? Long known as the Garden City of India, Bangalore is located on the Mysore Plateau, nearly 1,000 metres above sea level. Until 20 years ago, its climate was relatively cool and stable. Its houses did not require fans. Its residents needed blankets to keep warm at night. And the city was famed for its botanic gardens, its beautiful lakes, its stately shade-giving Ashok, Poinciana and Banyan trees. This pleasant environment made it highly attractive to the military and the aerospace industry, and subsequently to technology companies, a process that mirrored that of California in the United States. The high-tech companies of California took note of this development. They took advantage of India's cheap and plentiful labor supply, and Bangalore, was to become the Silicon Valley of India and a branch office of the original. Large office parks commissioned by the global giants whose names we know only too well were hastily assembled from mid-1990s on the affordable farmland surrounding the city. As prescribed from California, the architectural and construction methods were determined by the requirements for perfectly air-conditioned, computer-friendly workspace with a pan-global aesthetic. The office parks were built as agglomerations of hermetic boxes sealed by reflective glass walls so that they appeared corporate, slick and cutting-edge. Twenty years of frenzied construction and unfettered population growth and the business park requirement for reticulated landscaping have lowered Bangalore's water table from 30 metres to an estimated 500 metres. The endless sheets of reflective glass raise the immediate temperature of these new high-tech estates by an incalculable amount. I know, I've been there, I can tell you. And the city's infrastructure could not cope with the unprecedented expansion. As the water table has now effectively disappeared, Large trees can no longer be planted to shade the workers and screen the buildings. Bangalore is now India's fastest growing city. It is hot and polluted with terrible traffic and it can no longer be described as a garden city. The newly stagnant weed choked lakes and waterways have attracted worldwide notoriety for their spectacular snowdrifts of toxic chemical foam much of the city's landscape has become parched and arid and the ecosystems have been devastated. The climate has been changed. As a result of these drastically degraded circumstances, the corporate specifications for future business parks now prescribe ultra-high performance alt artificial cooling systems and heat reflecting glass, which of course further raises the local temperature. The multinational corporations have irrevocably changed the climate and the environment of Bangalore, and they must now expend an extreme amount of energy and money to overcome a problem of their own making. And the vicious cycle continues. That's what the book's about. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. At least we should have a, have a book now here to, I mean, it's at least it's lying there in the front, so you shouldn't miss okay, okay. to, to, <laughs> to uh, take it before you leave. Um, before we get into the dialogue with uh, Matthias, I invite uh, Richard and, and Monsum to give a brief overview in your current considerations and projects, please. Here it comes. I'll hold it, I'll hold it. That's okay. We can no, no, no. <laughs> Everybody wants one. <laughs> so, yeah. so, hang on, I just want to explain what's... Oh, no, you 
not going to talk about this. <laughs> well, this was my idea. <laughs> Here, we have the clogs. This is Guangzhou on a day in 1461. And here, <laughs> I'm not sure it's that simple, but anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, this, this book is, uh, it's something that started in a very small way. We wanted to just explain a, a, a master plan we'd done, and we'd felt like when we presented it, there was too much... Um, background that needed to be explained to the um, jury that we were talking to in Singapore. And, but uh, as we did it, it sort of grew and grew and grew and ended up um, as this book. Uh, so it's not a book of um, a project, a kind of monograph, it's more uh, just setting out this framework that we thought was necessary to understand what we were doing. And through doing it, we maybe understood a little more clearly what we were, we were trying to do as well. So what are we doing, Mansam? Sorry, we've been so busy we haven't had a chance to discuss this. We, is, yeah, <laughs> I think it's going to make sense. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's sort of difficult, I think, from, from Europe or America or Australia to realise the kind of explosion going on in these um, megacities that are developing mainly around the tropical belt. Uh, but we are talking about cities with populations that are going to grow to or already at, at 90 million, 55 million. So these are really problems of quantity, and quantity in the end gets down to uh, an, a shortage of earth to roll out the same kind of solutions that we rolled out in the 20th century. If we just multiply them to these ex by these multiples, we will cover the world with, with cities. But we felt the 20th century did some amazing uh, work in in uh, achieving a really high quality l of life for a lot of people. And so uh, the, the sort of master planning that emerged as a response to industrialization and uh, the world wars uh, was really sort of logical and heartfelt in a way of solving those urgent problems of the 20th century. Uh, for instance, Le Corbusier's plans, of course, problematic as well. and when you do see them rolled out uh, denser and closer together and over enormous distances in China, like the image at the top, uh, there are definitely shortcomings to the 20th century uh, proposals as well. The garden city as the antidote to crowding and industrialization uh, has delivered through uh, the garden suburbs of, of much of the Western world. Really amazing quality of life to so many people. And although it's like a favourite whipping boy for many people about it being a sort of a sterile and uh, um, uh, fairy tale environment, uh, in many ways it's an unrivaled paradise for people to live in. Uh, but when we look at 90 million people wanting to live on a quarter acre block, uh, it just, you know, the acres are not there for them to do it. And so we were wondering in our solution, you know, is there, uh, are there many ideas from the past that we can reuse since, uh, such as the uh, early visions for hyperdensity in New York? Uh, and can we combine them with, with this desire to live uh, beautifully and harmoniously with nature to create a kind of a, a garden city, mega city? So we had a few sort of strategies as we worked through it. So macro architecture, micro urbanism. This is thinking that as buildings get bigger and bigger, they become in a way like cities in themselves. And we might need to start uh, applying uh, urban principles to, to these mega buildings. And that the city, once it becomes more than two dimensional planning as 20th century planning mainly is where you just parcel the city and you give it use groups and zones, but it's essentially working off the ground plane. 
once we leave that behind and start working three-dimensionally, then the cities have to, in a way, become enormous pieces of architecture where they're thought about uh, spatially and in terms of uh, circulation and service delivery, less like a two-dimensional map and more like three-dimensional architecture. Are you going to chip in, Mansour? No. <laughs> <laughs> We've both, well. we've both been talking all day. How come I started? <laughs> uh, and some of these strategies we work through in the book, such as multiple ground levels, that at a certain density and uh, population growth, the, the ground plane simply becomes too congested and too contested to satisfy everybody's requirements. So we need to start multiplying ground levels uh, to get back the kind of space that we need for a good quality of life. Uh, both and is the concept where, uh, again, at a condition of hyperdensity, you can no longer just allocate one use to a building, but it has to do many things. So maybe it's, uh, it's a commercial area and a residential area and a power station and a sewage treatment plant. High density, high amenity is uh, to resolve that conflict that we see that most people see high density as more and more increasing pressure on existing amenity. And that's really because the way we currently develop cities is that the amenity is like a fixed asset that the city has, but it's very rarely enhanced and multiplied, and yet we're multiplying all the functional and commercial and residential spaces, so the pressure on that existing amenity gets more and more, and people justifiably find that not acceptable. But there's no re reason we can't multiply amenity in the same way that we multiply dwellings and office space. It's just that at the moment uh, there's not the, the, the pressure or the regulation or the, or the drive to do it. And so we're very interested in multiplying uh, schools and parks and uh, uh, piazzas up through buildings uh, in such a way that you can get a higher quality of life uh, even in conditions of hyperdensity. Uh, cities within cities, so once you get this urban fabric at a certain scale, you need to really think of all this stuff being organised in the way that we uh, already organise cities, uh, but in terms of a sort of navigable, memorable, imageable city, this needs to be done within a three-dimensional matrix. Uh, sky villages, uh, a similar concept that we need neighbourhoods within these giant constructions as well so that you really you can feel at home and you you have a sort of clearly defined and, and uh, imageable and area with a different character. Domesticated megastructures is that megastructures sort of have been portrayed in movies and comics and in futurist visions as something that's sort of awe-inspiringly um, mega and in some ways sublime but not comfortable. And we think there's no real reason that megastructures can't be uh, domesticated and cosy and small in scale and, and human uh, as, as um, villages or small towns can be. And the last one is the inverted skyline that uh, when a city gets tall enough that you really don't have access to the skyline without sort of bending your back back and looking way up into the sky, that no matter how enticing Hong Kong looks from Kowloon, once you're in the streets of Hong Kong, you're really experiencing a, a just the urbanism at street level. Uh, so our question with inverted skyline is if we uh, forget the bar graph skyline of the uh, 20th century uh, financial centre and think more of a, a city that's organised from first principles, perhaps we need a, a sort of more even energy layer on top for harvesting photovoltaic power, for instance, and we put that exciting dynamism of the skyline at the street level. So you may be dealing with a, a master plan that uh, orchestrates a series of volumes of public space uh, within the structure. I insist you take over for a while, Mansour. Well, Planting Cities released a chapter on how we have actually integrated uh, landscaping into our architecture. And I think it's actually sp quite easy to to sort of discern what they are. Screens of green really is how we use greenery in a vertical manner. Sky gardens really is about creating all these pocket gardens in elevated into our buildings. And when these gardens start becoming larger, 
and um, more people can actually use them, we start thinking of them as actually a sky part where they don't just benefit the people who actually use the bu uh, um, who owns the building collectively, but it actually becomes a, a public amenity that people beyond the development can actually come in to actually use them. So it's, a, it's one thing that you start then having high density and then creating high amenities where it benefit more people and um, rather than just the, um, the small group of people who actually own the building. And tropicograph tropicographical architecture well, at least for us, when we, when, we, when we had these ideas of how to integrate landscaping into our architecture, we, we really need to rethink how we actually think what architecture uh, in terms of this shape and form could be. And it actually led us to think we should start thinking about architecture as a um, geological formation where it actually starts to uh, support uh, uh, landscaping uh, and become an infrastructure for landscaping. It's, it's turning a bit into a lecture. We should go fast, we right? We should, yeah. <laughs> uh, breathing cities, really, uh, most of this giant expansion of the megacities is in the tropical region, and uh, there's quite a different relationship between inside and outside. So these are all strategies that we have for making sure our projects have access to light and air and are not really um, you know, an object with an inside and an outside, but a three-dimensional matrix of spaces with different environmental qualities. Uh, and that, man, much of it generated by trying to come up with plans where we're one unit thick, so wherever you are, you have uh, the ability to cross-ventilate and you don't rely on mech mechanical means to, to ventilate a building. After working through it all, we realised much of the stuff we were talking about was... Uh, you know, we were interested ourselves in the in the kind of data that we needed to uh, assess how much we had achieved in these areas. And we also realised when we were dealing with developers or city councils, there were plenty of ratios we were talking about. But again, they were sort of 20th century ratios. Uh, developers talk about net to gross efficiency, which is really, uh, you know, uh, profitability efficiency, but somehow people felt because it was a presented as efficiency, it seemed to have a moral dimension to it, that the smaller you could make the corridors and the meaner the public spaces, the more efficient you were, so that must be something good. Uh, and so we thought we should develop our own ratios, both to point out uh, the qualities in our buildings that we'd been trying to achieve and to be able to compare between them and maybe to stimulate others to uh, compete on these indices as well because we think they may result in a better world. So we have green plot ratio, which I think is something that's in quite common parlance, but also <laughs> community plot ratio, so how much public and community space within a project you've provided. Civic generosity, we came up with a series of um, measuring um, measurements, and so this is really like a personality profile of your project, because we thought that was really important. Is your building an arson, or is it a really nice citizen that's generous and giving and kind to the public realm. And I think it's an interesting thing to do because I think most buildings score very poorly on civic generosity. So we thought it would be good if, if it had a rating attached to it. Ecosystem contribution index. So this is saying going beyond just providing green, but now we're in the Anthropocene era. We really have a responsibility to all life on this planet. So can we start assessing how much each part of the planet that we're creating contributes to the ecosystem. And the last one, last one is self-sufficiency because we realised a lot of the rating systems <laughs> induce a kind of complacency that once you're platinum rated or gold rated, it feels like you've done everything there is to be done. But we thought if we take it against the absolute measure of how much this building is self-sufficient in, in energy, water and food, then we can really have a sort of long-term goal and you say, well, we may be lead platinum, but we're like 10% self-sufficient. And so it induces a sort of sense that there's still a very long way to go, even when we're doing the best we can. So in the book, we have a bit of explanation of those measures. And then we rated a series of our own projects under these, uh, uh, under these rating systems. And some we do well, some we do very poorly. But I think what we really want to do is to actually show you three projects using video 
and I think you can actually see, um, give a good idea what this is. And then after that, I think we want to have a discussion with Matthias, as I think Matthias have actually experienced some of these buildings, and we can actually talk and discuss about them. So this is Pipe Royal on Pickering, a hotel project in Singapore. And here we uh, achieved a 200% green plot ratio, or 250%. Uh, and interestingly, there's a, as much green in our project next to the park as there is in the park itself next to the building. So in some ways it's very romantic, in some ways it's quite um, <coughs> grotesque or grotto-like. Uh, but we also have a sort of real sense of excitement from this building. And if you do imagine a city built out of this kind of prototype uh, that's addressing all kinds of issues for the 20th, 21st century, we think you would end up with a very different kind of city. Interestingly, this uh, building has also been highly successful for the developer. Uh, the feasibility when it was done, they had a $200 a night room rate, they had a 60% uh, you know, occupancy estimate, and simply because of the, the um, architectural environment we created, uh, they've, the room rate is now $400, and they've had 100% efficiency. So. Uh, they actually managed to almost pay off the building within uh, three to four years. Next one, Skyville at, at Dawson is a public housing project. And here, uh, we're very excited about it because it really is a um, uh, middle to um, middle class, middle middle class uh, uh, project. It's not a high end luxury project at all. It's um, subsidized public housing by the government. Uh, and it, it deals with these issues we've been interested in terms of quantity. So this is 960 apartments in one building. Uh, but every apartment belongs to a smaller village of 80 apartments. And they share a, a, a public garden space. Uh, and on uh, every 11 floors, you can walk for 400 meters horizontally through the building. And so it has quite a different dimension, um, these spaces. They've gone beyond just being sort of pocket parks to real parts of the city. They're 100% accessible to the public. And the uh, families that live around here can just walk down a few flights of stairs and, and use these areas. At the same time, they have this interesting sort of dialogue between a sort of cozy domestic horizontality and a quite a futuristic verticality. But Singaporeans don't have vertigo. Everyone grows up in uh, high-rise buildings. <laughs> but we had one lecturer from Harvard who couldn't leave the lift. <laughs> uh, this park on top, we call this the penthouse for the people. So rather than the richest guy getting the best spot, here, the best spot is reserved for the public. So not just the inhabitants of the building, but anyone can just come here, take a lift up to the roof, uh, go for a jog or have a picnic or um, meet their friends.
So the building is just, uh, it's basically components that can be multiplied. So it's, it's uh, 12 villages of 80 homes each. And the plan shows how these uh, elements have been pulled apart to, so despite 960 uh, dwelling units, there's not a single internal corridor in the entire development. Every, uh, from the lift lobby to the apartment door is all naturally lit and ventilated. And every apartment only shares one wall uh, with its neighbor. No doubt this residential complex is quite big deal. It's like concrete jungle, but yeah, at the same time, it it's quite small scale in the sense that the units are actually housed within uh, certain villages. They're actually connected by all these intermediate sky gardens. It makes us want to not just stay within our homes, okay, but really to spend some time outside to just interact and bond with one another. I think with all this being presented together, it increases the chance for interaction and also engaging the neighbour and the people around you. That is something that's lacking around in many parts of Singapore where you're just purely living in an urban jungle. The idea of this building is trying to make it like a kampong style where you really try to meet up with each other. When you're getting quite late in the night, uh, it's actually very quiet and it's, the wind is good. So we can have our dinners while enjoying the view over there. That makes it a perfect place for us to communicate and then to socialise among other neighbours. They all sounded like they were coached, but I think it's because the, the, the public housing board was a bit worried that they wouldn't understand the building, so we gave a little instruction manual about the design of the building. And being good Singaporeans, they all studied it. And, uh, <laughs> and yes, they all learned it very well. Uh, the last one we're going to show is uh, Oasia Downtown. Uh, and for us, this is sort of quite a different attitude to landscape from the uh, topographic architecture. This one is like an enormous garden structure, uh, an arbor in the city. Uh, but where we were really excited was, you can see from the, the measurements, the green plot ratio we achieved is... Uh, 1100% uh, and for us that's uh, quite an interesting thing because it means one new building can in a way remediate for 10 other buildings in the city uh, and still achieve back to 100% as if the city had never been built in the first place. For us, what we like about this is it has a really strange delicacy, something very domestic, so that idea of the domesticated high-rise. Uh, despite being a very large building, it, it has the sort of quality of a, a trellis in a home garden. And some of these creepers have these purple flowers, and the purple flowers, um, they, uh, when they drop the flowers, which they drop every day, they are like little helicopters. and so. This building is sort of a little bit bridal in that it's always showering the footpath with uh, little purple flowers.
I think we just, uh, this is just a design party that was, um, we, we drew this up at the beginning. It's just actually a, a building that has stacked um, three stratum and it's actually just offices at the bottom, a hotel at the middle, and then you have a club in the at, at the top. But what we really want to um, show you is a time-lapse video uh, that was done over a period of six uh, months showing the growth of these creepers. And I think um, that it actually changes every day and you actually see the plants growing. That is actually a very alive uh, building. Thank <laughs> you.